As you know, three weeks ago I began a series leading to the Sunday which speaks of Christ's resurrection, a special series called In Praise of Jesus Christ. It is my intention to continue that series and to complete it Easter, but the Lord uh, especially led us in a direction last Sunday, as you all know, to have a special service focusing upon the death of Charles Bitterman, his martyrdom for Christ. I felt that I should take one more Sunday of special emphasis as a follow-up to last Sunday before returning to this series in praise of Jesus Christ. Because as I was praying about this service this week, it really struck me that so many people made commitments to the Lord last week. Some that came to the front last week came for the first time to make a commitment to Jesus. Others were coming as a fresh statement of recommitment to the Lord. I know of others that in their seats were making commitments to the Lord and for one reason or another did not come forward to the front. Some wished later that they had responded by walking forward. And I felt as I stood here worshiping last Sunday morning with those who came that there is something so powerful about giving yourself in an unreserved way to the Lord. And when you respond with a commitment to give your life to Jesus Christ, come forward at an altar call, there's a kind of a feeling that, oh, if, if I could just stay here. We are many times like Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw the glory of the Lord revealed and their instinctive reaction was to stay there, let us build overnight shelters. And it was the purpose of the Lord to give them that high-powered experience so that they could be charged to live for him in the, in the valleys below. I speak, therefore, this morning as a follow-up to that time of commitment last Sunday, a message that I simply called Press Surrender. What happens when we come forward? What spiritual counsel can I give you as a brother in the Lord and as your pastor that can make you aware of how to consolidate and follow up upon what God has begun in your life or restarted, I would give you three words of counsel. The first word of counsel that I would give you following any freshened or new spiritual experience is this word. Watch out for the wilderness experience. Now that's nothing negative. It's a positive statement of realizing what is next. Why do I single out a term, the wilderness experience. Well, it's because we have plenty of precedent for that in the Scripture. Following Jesus' baptism, well, let's take a moment at His baptism. At His baptism, the heavens opened, the Spirit of God descends in the form of a dove, a voice comes from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with Him I am well pleased. Now, I would submit to you that that's a special moment. That particular phenomena did not happen at my water baptism. And I don't think it happened at yours either. Although in a spiritual sense, we believe that God through the Spirit descended upon us and that God the Father is saying, I'm well pleased with this action. It's a very special experience for Christ. But immediately, Mark's Gospel says, immediately the Spirit, immediately after the baptism, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days fasting, tempted by Satan, with the wild beasts. No heavens opening. No Father's voice saying, I'm pleased with you. No Spirit of God descending in the form of a dove. Just Satan, sand, beasts, apparitions, danger, hunger, heat, cold, wilderness. Same kind of thing happened with the children of Israel. They have this great experience of the Exodus. Waters have parted on either side of them. Three days later into the wilderness, they run out of water. Forty-five days later, they run out of food. And one of the things that's happening in a great spiritual experience is that God allows us to go through a period of time. It may not be immediately after, but at some point we go through a period of time when that new commitment is tested to see whether or not the commitment was forged on the basis simply of a transitory emotional response or whether the commitment 
is forged in reality and that when the period of wilderness has been passed through, we know beyond the shadow of a doubt in emerging through it that the experience we had is now consolidated, part of us, eternal. It's part of what the New Testament calls being approved. It's a word that's used many times in Paul's epistles. It's a, it's a Greek word that we would perhaps translate to the kind of an idea of things coming down an assembly line and somebody is there as the tester of whether or not that part has indeed been formed according to the specifications which were required for it. There's a close look-see. It's, it's being looked over, approved. Now, with all my heart, I, I would like to tell you that the wilderness experience will not happen to your life <laughs> just because I don't like to go through tough things at all. But I'll tell you, when you make a fresh surrender, it's like coming up from R&R, &R, to use the military word. It's like coming up from R&R &R to go back to frontline duty. So, both, so as Peter says, don't be surprised at the painful or fiery trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. The great thing about the wilderness experience is that God always puts time limits on it. It doesn't go on forever. It just is for a period of time. It's like uh, the disciples in the storm at sea. It, it's localized and it has time limits on it. In my own experience, I found that sometimes after my greatest sermons, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I, I am like Elijah, subject to the worst depression. It's a wilderness experience. Heroes aren't made in peacetime. Heroes aren't made in lovely gardens. Heroes are made in the press of battle. A helpful passage of scripture for me has been, in addition to the baptism of the Lord and the wilderness experience, which I have cited. It's a beautiful experience of the wise men in the Gospel of Matthew. It said that they saw the star in the east and came, responded to that star. But we know from the text of Matthew's Gospel that the star went out of their sight. And they, having seen the star, followed the direction it was in. And only months and perhaps even a couple of years later did it reappear to them. What was so significant about them is that they continued to follow God after he gave them a starter sign of the direction he wanted them. And then for a period of time, God withdraws that special kind of guidance to test obedience. And when our obedience is tested and we've gone as far as we can go on obedience, then God gives us again a special direction. Don't always expect in our Christian life that there is going to be every day a special kind of star scintillating in the heaven that will give us guidance. Or that every day we're to have the same high level of emotional cleansing and feeling that we may have at a particular moment of spiritual commitment. God wants that special experience when we see our star in the east. He wants to get us going and following him and obeying him and running on the energy and the power that he, and the insight that he's given us in that moment. There are, as I look back upon my early Christian experience, I'm sure people must have told me this, but I have no recollection of their ever warning me about the wilderness experience. I had this view that somehow if I could just get right enough with God and dedicated enough to God, I would, I would never have any more battles. I would be through temptation and I would be untaught victoriously 100% for the rest of my life. And to my surprise, I would find out that after making special commitments to the Lord, I would find that the level of conflict had only deepened. Well, that's a kind of a counsel. Watch out for the wilderness experience. The second thing that I would say about a fresh commitment is get ready for a spiritual stretch. Get ready for a spiritual stretch. See a spiritual commitment in this term, a fullback who busts through the line. And everybody's been kind of clumped up in scrimmage to stop him on the line, but he gets past those first defenders, and all of a sudden he's out in open field, and seeing nothing ahead of him but the goal line, he runs like crazy. And there ought to be times in our spiritual life when God creates a special opening for us, and instead of just tiptoeing through it and going modestly, we ought to just see how far we can advance on that front all at once and go for a stretch experience. Peter had this in the Gospels when... The Lord comes walking across the water. He never in his, in his right mind ever could have believed that he could have walked on water. But he'd been rowing all night. And sometimes when you get tired, you get risky. At least I do. 
And uh, Peter goes for a stretch experience. He gets out and tries something that he never tried before, and he's successful at it. We must not forget that. He's successful at it. And uh, when he has a moment uh, of failure, the Lord is there to catch him so that it does not become a negative experience. So often we're limited by our, by our own mindset. We get an idea of what our capability is as a Christian person. And we think that's all the further we can be. We may have a certain way we read the scripture or a certain time of prayer. And we think that's all, that's all that those disciplines will ever involve for us. And God might be in your life opening up a whole new thing where perhaps it's been difficult for you to read the Bible five minutes a week. And all of a sudden, because of a special spiritual commitment that you've sensed in your heart, the Word of God becomes very living and real for you. And it may be possible for you to sit down and just absorb the Scripture an hour at a shot. Go for it. Go for the stretch. I've been taking uh, with my children a speed reading course from Witten Felt, who's a deacon and a member of our congregation. And I've been learning in that speed reading course how limited our own views are of our ability, how we often talk ourselves out of things. Uh, we're not supposed to talk about how fast we can read because that, that, that could be read wrongly, but I'll say this, that after five weeks in the course, I, I am reading five times now faster than I was five weeks ago. And if you'd have told me that five weeks ago that I could do that, I'd say, you're crazy. And I'd have used the old uh, slogan, well, speed reading is skim reading. But it's not. It's just getting used to a different concept. It's re restructuring the way you approach a book, the way you approach a page. And suddenly, you, you have a stretch experience. In fact, uh, one of the, one of the uh, I can't give away some of the things in the course because we signed a contract that says we can't reveal the methodology. <laughs> but uh, suddenly I'm beginning to toy with the idea that it might be possible for me to read 20 times faster than I was reading when I started the course. The Lord may give us a real breakthrough experience in a, in a spiritual area. Perhaps it involves exercising a spiritual gift. Maybe it is in our prayer life and in praying to the Lord even in an unknown language, something perhaps that in an experience we've been very timid about and suddenly the Lord will give us a goal and he wants us to stretch and run with it and go further and faster than we've ever gone before. Well, in a stretch experience, what happens sometimes is that we get worried about falling back. You know, we, we, we really accelerate all of a sudden in an area. And then we say, but I can't keep up that pace. Don't worry about that. Go as fast as you can. And then I'll tell you this. The spiritual growth is not like this. We often think of spiritual growth as here's starting point and here's final point. 100%, right? We're perfect. Uh, isn't that the goal you're working for? Perfection? Isn't that the goal you've set for your husband? No? <laughs> <laughs> Here's where you are now. So what is spiritual growth? Spiritual growth, if, if, if you don't analyze this much, but I think my impression sitting in the pew for many years is that uh, spiritual growth is, is you start out and you just a steady climb. Straight up. You know spiritual growth isn't like that. There are many theories, models of spiritual growth. Some have spiritual growth like this. My spiritual growth is somewhat like this. And I don't canonize this or say this is inspired or this is necessarily a model for you to follow. But my spiritual growth, I found that my growth is something like this. <laughs> Sudden accelerated spurt. And then a kind of a fallback. But I've noticed that the position you fall back to is ahead of the last position you were. So that your new low is higher than your last high. <laughs> or at least close thereunto. I've been playing Georgie for a number of years in basketball. One-on-one -on -one scrimmage. When we first started, what were we, George? You were in about third grade or so? And I, of course, I'm a lot bigger than he is. I'm a lot better than he is. And <laughs> so, so I'll have to tell this. I, I, I don't think I've told George this, but I'd let him get ahead, you know. And uh, I'd make him work for the last two points, but... Now he's, he's, he's getting pretty good. He's in sixth grade now, and, and he, can, he can, well, I'm not going to admit that he can beat me without some help on my part, but uh, 
he's getting good. I've noticed that he's developed a shot that, that to me is, is really neat, that I can't block it. And it's sort of a fall away jump shot that comes, he holds the ball somehow off his shoulder, in between his shoulder and his head, and, and falls backwards and manages to throw it up and make it most of the time. And I thought to myself, how in the world did he develop that crazy shot? It's so unorthodox. And then I realized he developed it because of my high arms guarding him, and he had to find a compensation for it to somehow get around that. And if he can keep on developing that shot someday, he might be pretty good on the basketball court. I thought, well, there's an analogy to that spiritually, that often the thing that comes uh, abuts against our life and we just think it's such a nuisance and we can't climb around that, in a stretch experience, God gives us the ability to compensate for that and we develop a response in our life that somehow vaults us ahead of where we were. A person has written, if you reach for the stars, you may not make it, but at least you won't wind up with a handful of mud. <laughs> Go for it. Someone, The same person said, never tie a rabbit to a cow to see how fast the rabbit will run. Don't compare what's happening with you with somebody else, all right? They may be the cow, and God may want you to be the rabbit. First two points. Get ready for a wilderness experience, and get ready for a spiritual stretch. Third, to consolidate and grow after making a fresh commitment to the Lord. Third key that I would identify is find a need and meet it faithfully. Find a need and meet it faithfully. Consolidate that experience into some practical expression of Christian service. It may be an expression of Christian service that finds you at work somewhere in this church body. It may be an expression of Christian service that finds you at work somewhere in the world, in the neighborhood, community in which you live. But find a meaningful way to faithfully, and I don't mind that word faithfully, because in spiritual commitment, it's so important to be just as strong on the finish as on the start. I am great at starting things. God's speaking to me about finishing what I've started. Faithfully. Picture with me a great rushing river. All that water in the rushing river doesn't do anybody any good unless it's divided off into streams, and the streams are divided off into rivulets, and the rivulets find their way down an irrigation canal, and ultimately the water must find itself down to one row. And when... Uh, and when God is moving by his spirit across the whole group of people, ultimately the flood of his spirit has to, has to go down to that one row where you are and the one row where you are in ministry and fellowship with other people. Or to use another analogy, a great rain, as we know in Southern California, if it comes down all at once, simply runs off and causes slides. But if it's steady, we find a way to conserve and channel it. And that's the same way with the moving of God's spirit. We cannot do everything, but we can do something. Now, the last thing I want to do is by saying find a need and meet it faithfully is all of a sudden put everybody under a guilt trip that makes a spiritual commitment and, and now saying, okay, start willing to do things. And look at, uh, look at what is before you, look at the needs. There, By the way, there are a lot of needs for persons in ministry within this church fellowship. You can spot them by reading through the bulletin and, or by talking with myself or Wayne or other people in the pastoral staff or the deaconesses or the deacons and the like. A lot of needs. The last thing I want to do is tell you, you know, get a hold of your willpower now and get on with it. I've, I was impressed by a statement, if I can refer to Winton Feld again, that he made in the speed reading class. He said that uh, someone had determined that when... Our will is in conflict with our imagination. Our imagination will always win. That, uh, that explains why I have had such a difficult time even thinking about getting off coffee. You know, here, all these... I'm going to preach myself now in a conviction, all right? And I didn't even plan to say this, but I'm into it. Here, all these years, I've... I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I'm one of those strange persons that never even took a puff. Ne never even wanted to find... My brother wanted to find out one time what a cigar was, and I think he got sick. But, um, but I've never, I never even wanted to find that out. And I, I, you know, I could never understand why it was hard for people who smoked to give it up. I mean, 
It just would seem to be, just quit, right? So there's me and coffee. That way we know now that cigarettes help produce cancer. And now a study comes out this week. And of course my first response is, we'll get a second opinion. Study's not valid. Besides, I'm getting so much enjoyment out of this, you know, what's another couple years? It's not how long you live, it's how well you live. It's whether you enjoy what you're doing. And I sit down and I say, now I know I ought to give up this coffee. But my imagination is in conflict with my will. So my imagination tells me, George, that is really good. It's just, it, when your hands are cold, you hold the cup in your hand. It just makes them warm. How, how, how could you possibly drink something cold with your chocolate donut in the morning? <laughs> warm. Something's got to be warm. And somehow I've got to find a way to get my imagination in line if, if I'm going to make this break. I'm not saying now, this sermon is not a declaration that I've made a commitment uh, on this sermon. <laughs> but you can tell something's going on. I'm in a conflict. Uh, so Paul talks about this in Romans 7. Uh, what I ought, I do not, and what I... Anyway, what happens in a time of uh, spiritual commitment is that the Lord revitalizes our imaginations. He doesn't simply revitalize our will, which is part of serving the Lord, is having a will that's energized by the Spirit of God, but it's also having our imagination revitalized. If, for example, I'll just use this as an analogy, uh, if you're a, an elementary Sunday school teacher in the church, Probably had the experience of working hard at the job all week, tired, a uh, few weekends off a, uh, a year. In fact, many weekends off a year without any commitment. Sounds like a great idea. And uh, sometimes in an elementary class, the kids uh, can get to be, a, you know, a, a chore to, to have that kind of regular commitment. Kids are fun, but sometimes they can be a nuisance, too. And uh, you could say uh, to yourself, well, now i got to get a hold of my willpower and show up every Sunday at that class. But ultimately, you'll probably lose the battle with the will because the idea of having uh, two Sundays off out of every four to spend one at the beach and one in the mountains, if you can afford it, sounds uh, really like a great idea. But uh, I think we need a better image of what can be done with that elementary class, for example. That uh, here are a group of kids whom God is at work in their lives. Begin to picture them 10 years down the road. They have graduated from high school. They are now making the decisions about what they're doing with their lives, who they're going to marry, what their ministry or vocation is going to be. And they look back and they say, that, that elementary Sunday school teacher, let's say it's a third grade Sunday school teacher, never had a teacher like that. They were interested in me. I remember that they took time to be with me personally. I remember they inspired me to love the Bible and love God and love Christ. I'll tell you, when, when you can get a vision of impacting a person's life rather than putting, plugging in 50 minutes in a Sunday school class, that makes all the difference in the world. I'll never forget. I, I, don't, I really honestly believe I would not be a pastor today had I not had this tremendous experience when I was in junior high school Mom and Dad were pioneering this little church in Jeffersonville, Indiana. And uh, we were short on people. You know, a good Sunday at the beginning was 20, 30 people, which are when, you, when you start a church from scratch, you don't get a whole lot of people to begin with. And so I got thrust into, into teaching Sunday school class, and I was given the four- and five-year-olds. And all we had, we basically had a one-room sanctuary, and the back two pews were flippable. I mean, you could pick them up and flip them. I had the four- and five-year-old kids on these two pews facing one another. I didn't have much curriculum or anything. All I had was a Sunday school quarterly. And we started with three or four kids. And, you know, I got so excited about teaching those kids. It wasn't a chore. It was fun. And I didn't have anything about educational psychology, but somehow I got a hold of this idea of getting a little shoe box and putting little figures in it and background scenery and putting the lid on the box, cutting a hole in it and peeping through it. And that's the way I maintain order in that class. Was that for dutiful obedience and listening to the lesson at the end, the peep box got passed around and all the kids 
that had been good got to see the peat fox. We got up to about 20 kids in that little class in the back of that sanctuary. And somehow God, I think, worked in my young heart to make me realize that that teaching was more than simply putting in a performance. It was seeing what God could do in an area of responsibility. Maybe my vision of that is clearer now even than it was then. But I, I really think that when God is calling you to a place of service and responsibility, you must bring to it more than a willpower. Uh, you, I, I would ask the Lord, Lord, give me a vision of what you want to see me doing. Help me to visualize how I can be effective in this. Remembering the word of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And I'll tell you, when you're working with a higher goal and something else comes along, it's easy to turn it down because it doesn't fit into this higher scene that God is giving you. I don't believe God ever promotes anyone who is doing nothing. We start where we are. God one day appeared to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to do something for me. Moses didn't have the idea of what he could do, and he protested. The Lord finally said to him, Moses, what's in your hand? Only a rod. But with that rod, God did something so very significant. He parted waters. He did miracles. He brought water out of rock. And I think the Lord does the same thing with each one of us. He asks us in respect to Christian service, what's in your hand? What's possible for you? What have I laid right at the door of opportunity for you? Take it, give it to me, and watch me do something special with it. Spiritual growth takes place, is consolidated, and continues to take place as we give. And unless we give ourselves in meaningful and faithful ways of Christian service, a commitment to the Lord cannot be consolidated. It will be like seed that is sown upon thorny ground. And it will spring up for a while. But the cares and the delight in other opportunities will choke out the potential that was started. Ask the Lord to give you a vision of what in the body of Christ He wants you to faithfully do and respond to and have a ministry and responsibility for. And God will consolidate in a powerful way that growth within your life. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Now our Lord, we come to you with fresh thanksgiving in our hearts today for how you are at work. I thank you, Lord, for the many, many people that responded last Sunday in commitment to you. I thank you for the many young people that last evening at the retreat, after sharing these themes with them, responded anew in commitment to you in their lives. Lord, you're not only doing a whole new work in the congregation as a corporate body, but I sense that you're doing a whole new work in many of us individually. You're calling us in a way that is fresh and exciting, that bids us to follow you, to leave behind the enclosure that we have been in for the last maybe even years of our life, to step out of the safety of that uh, routine spiritual dimension that we have been in and to thrust forward into new breakthrough in our lives. You're seeking to plow new ground to go before us in new ways. And Lord, I thank you for the fresh creative work of your spirit that is doing this. Now, Lord, we hear your word anew today. I pray that for each one who is pressing through, that you will give them power in the wilderness. Power to consolidate. Power to say no to temptation. Power to come through victorious, learning tremendous lessons in faith. I pray, Lord, for the many who are going through a stretch experience in their lives right now, who never thought that they were capable of certain kinds of ways of speaking or acting or disciplining themselves as a Christian. Where we've run the mile in 16 minutes, Lord, now it's down to eight or nine. 
Empower us, Lord. Where we thought it was impossible to share our faith with the person at work. Uh, Lord, you're giving a whole new ability to approach it from a from a backdoor angle. To come in at a, at a in a way we did not see before. You're breaking through. As we see the open door, Lord, we're going to run to it and through it and into the open ground. And then, Lord, there are so many places in the body of Christ, in this church body, and in our community that need our regular and faithful presence. Our culture and advertising have conditioned us to be consumers and customers. So we're not used to so much having it another kind of way. Lord, let us not only be customers of your word, but doers. Empower our imagination to see ourselves in places of ministry that have an impact in your world. This we ask in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.